Levin. Hello. How's everyone doing? Good. Welcome. Uh, have you enjoyed the conference so far? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right. We, well, we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience. I'm going to just run through them pretty quick. Um, first one is, what is the right time to migrate to Vue 3? Vue 3 is released and stable, but there's still some plugins and component libraries that are not compatible. Um, so this depends on your dependencies, right? So um, the the real blocker that we've heard so far really all, all ties into the dependencies. So um, two of the biggest ones are Nuxt and Beautify. So which we know uh, both are uh, full V3 compatible versions are coming. So once they're out, uh, people waiting on these should definitely upgrade. If you don't have hard dependencies that's strongly coupled to Vue 2 and you can't move off of, then definitely also upgrade to Vue 3. The only blocker I see right now is if you have a really heavy dependency that you just can't deal live without, but it, it, it doesn't have a Vue 3 compatible version. That's the only thing, really. Uh, if you're starting a new project, 100% go Vue 3. Perfect. Yeah, we've definitely heard that from a couple of speakers this conference. Uh, let's see, what are the main benefits to migrate to migrate to Vue 3? So um, there are literally every aspect of the framework is better, right? So you get um, better runtime performance, smaller payload size, you get better hydration performance, better service side rendering performance. Um, and, and these are non-trivial improvements, uh, like service side rendering is like two to three times faster, literally. Um, the and then the IDE support and all that. So um, when you use uh, better TypeScript integration, uh, native composition API, uh, the new script setup syntax. Um, so, and the uh, Volar, which also supports Vue 2, but you know, like most of the new innovations, the new tooling improvements that we're shipping in the ecosystem, uh, while some of them also work for Vue 2, right? Uh, they are all sort of, it work more efficiently with Vue 3, in a sense, because, uh, for example, the Vue 3 ships native TypeScript um, typing, which Volar picks up to give you uh, JSX-like, TSX-like IntelliSense in your Vue components. So um, overall, the, D uh, the DX is just on another level. Um, so, of course, with Vite, um, Vite has the official Vue 3 plugin. We do have a community-maintained Vue 2 plugin which probably also works for you. But um, if you're starting a new project, you probably want to just go view beat plus view three to get the best of possible DX. Awesome. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite uh, feature in view three? And I'm curious if this has changed over time. Uh, definitely. Uh, initially, it was just overall, it's faster. That's the biggest thing mm -hmm. about it. But now script setup is absolutely my favorite. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people are excited about that. Um, and let's see, starting a new project, what do you suggest? V, Nox, or Vue CLI? Um, new project with Vue 3. Def uh, so this kind of depends on what you're building, right? If you're building a, um, you're, you want to do full stack SSR, of, of, of course, probably Nux when it comes, Nux 3 when it comes out, because uh, it just takes care of most of the, lower level details when you have to deal with in an SSR app, you know, uh, coordinating your application with your service side functions, uh, production deployment and all that, right? That's the value where, where Nux kind of handles. So with V, if you, you can do SSR with V, but you'd have to know how it works to, to put mm -hmm. everything together yourself, right? If it's, that's your thing, some people like that, right? You can use V2. But if you're building a pure client side app, pure client side SPA, Starting with Vite is the easiest, lowest overhead way to do it. And then uh, also would mention if you are, you have a largely back side, back end dominating app, like a Laravel or Rails app, you can also use Petite View, uh, which mm -hmm. is the 6KB prog progressive enhancement focused version of Vue. Um, Vue CLI, I would say um, in the long run, it's probably going to go in maintenance mode. Uh, we do have an imminent Webpack 5 co compatible version coming for VCLI, but if you're starting a new project, unless you have very specific need of uh, Webpack specific features like module federation, otherwise I would I would suggest go with Beat. And then if you are 
building, say, a static generated site, uh, mostly content. Say, if your content is largely articles, like written in markdown files, then go with Vpress. Ooh, nice. I like how you throw another option in there. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. When do you think it's a good time to use the uh, comp composition API instead of the object API? Uh, so there are different ways to look at this, right? Um, so first of all, if you have a large scale application, so if you use TypeScript, I would strongly suggest go with composition API. If you have the demand for scale, for example, you know the project is going to be big, you know there's going to be a team of multiple people who are competent working on it. I will also really strongly suggest go composition API all the way. Um, there are other very practical considerations uh, in real world scenarios, like say you're building something simple, you don't really care, worry about extracting or using logic, or you are mostly working with entry level developers who maybe have a hard time grasping the concepts inside Composition API, right? So there are legit reasons where you want to stick with the object API, but most of the time, um, it kind of depends on how, how comfortable you are with Composition API. Uh, if you're comfortable enough to use it as, an, as your main way of doing things, then um, I would suggest going Composition API all the way. Otherwise, um, it, it's object API is still there. It's not definitely not going away. So um, I would say you, you kind of have to look at it uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. But our new documentation will actually give you some more information on what to what to use under what kind of situations. Awesome. Um, what do you think of uh, Nox using Vite under the hood? That's great, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think it's it's a great move for Nux to become a bundler agnostic because uh, the value of Nux as a framework is to give you a whole stack to develop with. Uh, in many ways, uh, being tightly coupled to a specific bundler kind of, in the long run, it will kind of create issues uh, that you just can't move off of certain thing. Uh, so I think it's a smart move, uh, being able to leverage feet. Um, and, you know, when beat gets faster, Nux gets faster too. So Nice. Yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> uh, let's see, what, what is your opinion about Webpack fight feature, uh, future? Sorry. Um, you know, I think Webpack has, uh, has, it, it's, it's still a great project. Uh, it, just from a user's perspective, right? Um, I think Webpack was initially designed to solve a very, very wide range of problems. It can bundle like node libraries, can bundle web apps and all that. But in the meantime, because it tries to cater for every possible use case, its internals becomes extremely complex which makes it very difficult for an average user to use efficiently. So most, most of the time you have to like, most users use it through a layer of proxy, like a pre-configured Webpack configured by other people. And this creates further complexity when all the tools in the chain kind of, you know, uh, tangle with each other and makes it impossible, makes it a black box for the end user to understand what's going on. Uh, so I think um, the problem is its complexity is only justified because the tool is, aim is aiming to solve so many problems. Uh, but if we narrow the focus, say Vite is specifically focused on web apps, right? We are an ESM dev server that only works in the browser. With that premise, uh, and also we know what web developers typically want, right? So we condense all these conventions, focus on the web space. This allows us to remove a ton of complexity and give you a better develop de development experience when you fall in our target audience, right? So essentially, it's a different optimization strategy. Uh, so because Views users overlap with Vite's target audience so much, right? So it, I feel like for 90, per, maybe 99% of users, Vite will be good enough, right? Uh, there will be some power users or really rare edge cases where you may still want Webpack, and it's fine, right? You should you probably you should probably use webpacking in the cases where it it, it makes sense. But uh, I think V just uh, serves a better purpose for the majority of average users. Awesome, thanks. Uh, let's see, what is your favorite Nux plugin? Um, that's a hard one. To be honest, I most of the the times <laughs> I've used Nux, I don't even use any plugins. It just it's just basic stuff. 
So yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, let's see. What's the next? What's the next anime view version we'll use? <laughs> uh, that's. I can't tell you that. <laughs> yeah, we gotta it's, wait. We yeah, just have to wait. <laughs> yeah. If I tell you that, there's no suspense. <laughs> Is that an option? <laughs> let's see. Will the combination of Nox three and View three and Vite allow us to move away from Webpack entirely? Yeah. Yes. Nice, easy question. <laughs> yeah. uh, what place do you see uh, for Nox in the future, especially given the recent progress with Vite, um, which now supports more features than originally um, a recent of the Etra of Nox? Uh, so they are tools of targeting different purposes. They're serving different purposes, right? Vite is still a build tool. It's, um, it's a dev server and bundler. It covers part of the SSR, but as far as I know, Nux doesn't actually use Vite's uh, SSR strategy because it does its uh, does this it has its own Nitro engine, so it leverages V to some extent. But the important thing is uh, Vite is a build tool. Nux is a framework, right? Vite is not a framework. It's actually framework mm -hmm. agnostic. People can build framework on top of Vite, and that's exactly what Nux is doing, right? They are building on top of Vite to leverage Vite's uh, efficiency but also uh, provide value of its own. And, and I would argue the value of Nux is not really like abstracting away build tools. It's all about having a coherent framework that allows you to think about your application as a full stack from end to end. Um, by the way, we are getting a lot of questions from, uh, from the live chat, so I'm trying. I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> um, what is your deep uh, your deep drive to keep going? Um, what are your uh, with what you're doing and um, getting better on yourself and your outcome of your work? Uh, there are obviously very practical reasons. Like I have two kids, I need to you know keep everything going. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's really. Um, I think when I decided to do open source full time, like it's because I just enjoy writing code. Uh, and it gets better if my code is used by a lot of people, helping them to build stuff, right? That, I mean, that in itself feels pretty amazing. So even though sometimes it can indeed get pretty, um, there, there's some tough work involved, but uh, you know, at uh, most of the time, it, it's really like the main driving factor is when people say thank you for what you've created. That's really all, all it's about. Well, uh, Evan, I'll take a moment here and say thank you for everything you've created <laughs> you. from all of us. <laughs> um, you. No, you you and the team have been doing a lot of work and it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, all right, let's keep going with the questions here. Any updates uh, about Vue 3 and, and native script um, or Vue native? Uh, actually, not much news as far as I can tell. I know Igor's been, Igor's been um, working on it, but he's probably busy with other stuff. So I, I wish could, I, I wish I can see NativeScript invest more into the view integration, though. I think it's still a great, uh, great viable option if they just invest a bit more into it. Maybe when we, um, I think it's a good time for them to start uh, looking at it again. I mean, uh, I know they've already had a somewhat working prototype already, so. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah. um, what is the best approach for handling CFP, CSP in Vue or Nuxt? Uh, that's kind of a separate question, right? Because Nuxt has a lot to do with I couldn't talk too much about how Nuxt does it because it, it's a very implementation detail stuff. With Vue itself, the only thing, the only time it would come into play with CSP is when you do in-browser compilation, which requires the new usage of new function, which is essentially eval to some extent. But uh, but most people don't really do that. If you're using a build tool, you can pre-compile templates. There's no CS CSP concerns involved most of the time. Yeah, so you can use as strict of CSP as you want. Um, what are the next big things coming to view? Um, some interesting stuff that I can mention, for example, the, the new ref sugar, I think it's going to be pretty interesting. Um, for those who don't know, uh, you should go to the uh, RFC repo. There is a discussion thread 
um, essentially it allows you to get rid of dot value when you're using comp composition API. Uh, it even works outside of view components. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that we're currently looking into is, uh, so the next 3.3 will ship a lot of uh, improvements regarding server-side rendering. We're looking at some interesting ways. Uh, for example, the thing that I recently shipped in VPress essentially uses Vue to static generate a site, but doesn't ship any JavaScript. Uh, basically just using Vue as a server-side templating language, right? Um, but but it's still a Vue application running in Node.js, you, but you don't need to ship JS on the client if you don't need interaction, right? So that's the thing. So the next step would for us to make this more give you the ability to do this at a more granular level. For example, some of the recent trends is like partial hydration or lazy hydration. You know, uh, we want to have this built in into the framework and uh, there are some interesting explorations we're doing. Um, yeah, I would say, yes, that's probably where the, the biggest thing that's going to happen next. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Oh, this one's funny. Um, why are French words uh, used for each new view related product? <laughs> um, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I guess it, it's it's just every time I look up the word and their translations in different languages, uh, usually the French word looks the most elegant in some way. So <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. Do we still need to delay hydration with U3 to get good performance scores? Um, it, it really depends, right? So, um, for example, like in, in VPress, I'm, I'm recently building, rebuilding the Vue website with VPress, which is still in SPA mode. It means we're hydrating. So the whole theme is built as Vue components. And when you load the page, it actually hydrates a real SPA. And granted, I'm on a fast machine. I'm using an M1 Mac, but the, high, the whole hydration takes 16 milliseconds. That's like one frame uh, of mm -hmm. how many? Maybe there's close to 50, 60 components on the page, I think. Um, and that's, that's one frame. Um, so the performance is, is really going to be... Ex you know, the, the hydration cost is really going, compared to Vue 2 specifically, Nux 2, or uh, the hydration cost is just going to be so much better because uh, Vue 3's compilation strategy already does a lot of uh, very fine-grained optimizations. For example, all the static parts on your page, uh, during the hydration phase, we actually skip all the static parts uh, because there's no point in hydrating static parts, right? The compiler detects them and skips them during hydration. So we only hydrate... The, the ones that has event handlers, for example. So the hydration performance itself is already much better. And then there are the things that I talked about earlier, like built-in lazy hydration for async components. So when you define an async component, you can say, I want this async component to only hydrate when it say comes into view or when the media query matches. Um, so these will be built-in, so you don't have to do a lot of extra work to get these. Um, and then there are more advanced stuff like marking a part of your component tree server only. Uh, so in the client bundle, we actually just drop them and ignore the hydration. Now this one is a bit more tricky because it involves, uh, like you can only do this when certain conditions are met. So actually the, the technical aspect is the easy part. The hard part is like detecting all the, all the conditions that you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and warn the developer, right? So, um, so that's actually some a lot of these things we're looking into. So, just expect Vue three and Nux three by extension to get better and better in terms of hydration performance in the long run. Perfect. Thanks, Evan. Uh, let's see. What is the biggest feature that you wanted to bring to Vue three but had not been able to? Um. Everything we do, we want to bring it, we put it on the roadmap, so they'll eventually be there, right? <laughs> so uh, some of the big features, like, uh, I think a lot of stuff in Vue 3 are pretty ambitious. Like, we the whole compiler optimization strategy for both client-side and server-side, 
uh, we actually produce completely different output for a client side build and server side build to get better performance. Um, composition API, the new ref sugar script setup. None of uh, all of these are pretty uh, substantial stuff uh, with a lot of edge cases. If you go into the RFC threads, you'll see like really it's a lot of uh, design work that's that's involved in making sure all the little details are covered. Um, but you know it, it's uh, it's also a privilege to be able to to take the time to do this. You know, uh, luckily we have the support of the community, the sponsors to allow us to to take our time to make sure we only ship the good stuff. All right, thanks, Evan. Uh, let's see, what is the long-term vision for Vue? Sorry? Oh, long-term the... vision. Mm -hmm. I mean, Vue's goal has always been to help developers build better web, app web applications, right? Uh, so whatever it takes to achieve that goal is the long-term vision of you. So um, if we can improve the DX, we'll do that. If we can improve the mm -hmm. performance uh, for UX, we'll do that. Um, it's, a, it's, it's going to be a moving target, right? The only thing that stays the same is we want to uh, help you, the developers, in turn, get happier customers, right? So... Perfect. Um, let's see. View three has a lot of styles to choose from. What would you recommend? Um, so right now, my personal, my personal choice is uh, script setup uh, with Composition API and TypeScript. Uh, I'll probably start using Ref Sugar in a bit because mm -hmm. I feel like it's already in a pretty good place now. Um, but. Um, Right, Vue, Vue does have a lot, a lot of styles, but we want to make sure we understand that it's these different styles. They do not exist just because we can. It's really serving different purposes. Uh, for example, you can use Vue with or without single file components because not every application demands a build step, right? So if you're using a build step, then definitely you should use single file components. And um, some people like to use say class components, like I'm not, you know, I, I'm not saying class is bad, but like in some ways it's because Vue is so flexible. You can really bend it in any shape you want, but the, the default recommended way there, that's something we've been working on in the new documentation. We want to give you a new sort of recommend set new set of recommendations this is what you will use if you follow these you'll get guaranteed to get good dx um and good scalability in the long run so uh, so really uh i uh the the new documentation is going to contain a lot a lot of good content so uh definitely stay tuned for that Ooh, sounds exciting <laughs> Yeah. Um, will we have DevTools support for the setup function that returns uh, the VDOM? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Yeah, it's it's a it's challenging because um, it's challenging because when you use a, a render function, essentially everything is inside a closure, so the DevTools don't even have a way to see them. I think what we can probably do is. You'll probably need someone needs to write a Babel plugin or a whatever plugin that takes your code, find all the variables declare, declared in your setup scope, and then expose them alongside your render function so that the dev tools can see them. I think I think I think that's the only way to do it. Yeah. Come on, community. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Will the compos will composition API replace Vuex stateful services? In some way, it can. Uh, and, and to be honest, I'm, you know, some of the existing designs that we have for the next major version of UX look very, very close to plain composition API, right? And in fact, if you use Pina, which is great, right? It al already feels pretty much like, you know, pretty close. Uh, so. Nothing is set in stone, but we also have some ideas about, you know, a more 
ergonomic way. Because right now you can just use a reactive object as a store that already works, right? The problem is it doesn't have DevTools integration. It doesn't, if you import it as a singleton, it won't work with SSR. So um, there could potentially be a built-in API in view core that directly allows you to define a reusable store that doesn't require you to explicitly provide injected, also works with SSR with all that, with the DevTools integration and all that built-in. Um, it's all possible. So um, I don't know if it's going to be in 3.3, maybe. Uh, but that's something that we've been experimenting with. Yeah. Nice. Um, let's see. We keep getting... We keep getting Nox 3 spoilers. Can you give away a view 3 spoiler for incoming feature? I just did. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. All right, let's see. How are you liking the progress made on Volar and view DX so far? Oh, uh, it's absolutely amazing because uh, I think Johnson and Rahul has been doing amazing explorations in this regard. Uh, I've been using Volar mostly, most lately, and honestly, it exceeds my expectations in a lot of ways. Um, Johnson is a is a is a beast. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm nagging. <laughs> I'm like testing him from time to time on on Discord because I'm like, hey, like there's this thing. Can you fix it? fix it? And the next morning, Johnson's like, I just published a new version. Uh, That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty amazing, uh, to be honest. Uh, and and with TypeScript and script setup, and Volar, the experience is just um, you don't worry about mistyping things anymore. Everything is auto completed, type checked. It, it it's great. Yeah. Nice. Um, are you still surprised to see View or Nox in the wild? For example, the new Matrix website has all the cool trailers. <laughs> yeah, I mean for. Normal websites, I'm kind of no longer surprised. I guess the, the recent surprise was when I was checking out the new iPhones. I was like, what? View icon on the Apple website. That's pretty cool. Um, cool. Yeah, so the iPhone compare page is built with you, although it seems like a pretty small use case, but it is, it's still nice. Um, that is pretty cool, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'm getting used to it now. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, let's see. Could you go a little bit more into detail on Petit View? Um, when to use it, and what's this? What's the main strength? Uh, so yeah, so Petit View is specifically designed for the case where you have a traditional backend framework like Laravel or Rails or um, whatever Java backend, you know, that already spits out HTML. Um, and you want to get some really light interaction work done on the front end, There's, it's not going to be an SPA. Uh, it's really just so, say maybe you have a pretty complex form. Uh, it would feel pretty overblown if you pull in the whole view stack or React mm -hmm. stack or whatever, right? You, you even need a build tool chain and all that integration. Sometimes you just need light interactions. And Petit View is exactly for that. It's only 6 KB. You can put it in from a CDN or just like link to it with a normal script tag. And then you write your templates directly in the DOM. And the efficient part about uh, Petit View is, um, so Pet Petit View use, reuses the reactivity system with standard View 3. So they have the exactly same reactivity core uh, and they have the same template syntax. So you'll feel really right at home in terms of just writing templates, getting some state and seeing everything update. Um, but at the same time, it just trims away most of the features you probably won't need for a simple interaction, like sprinkling interactivity on a page kind of use case, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's also more efficient than pulling in, say, jQuery, which is pretty huge nowadays, or pulling in the Vue 3 version that has the in-browser compiler, because the Vue 3 compiler it's a uh, it's a lot more advanced than the Vue two one. It does a lot more optimizations, but also kind of makes the in browser version a bit heavier than Vue two, right? So if you're pulling the in browser compiled version of Vue three, it's about six. Uh, it's about forty KB compared to Petit View, which is six KB. Also, Petit View walks your DOM template directly and then mutates them in place. 
So there's actually no temp so-called compilation. It's really just like your directives are already on there. That's kind of how view one works. It just takes over your DOM and then changes it with fine-grained reactivity. Whereas um, when you use view three proper without pre-compilation, it's kind of wasteful because we take the DOM, stringify it, compile it, and then re-render it, then replace the old DOM, right? That's kind of uh, inefficient. So Petit View is essentially my pet peeve because, you know, if we're if we know we're doing only light interactivity, uh, mm -hmm. there's a more optimized way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a lot of use cases for this. Um, let's see, what's the state of TypeScript support and templates? It's pretty, pretty good. Uh, actually, I can show you. Uh, oh, please. If you, haven't, if you haven't used Bolar, uh, you should definitely, definitely check it out. So here's a screen share, right? So um, I have, uh, this is a REPL. So this is a project that compiles view com single file components right in the browser. So I'm using script setup with TypeScript. Let me make it bigger. Um, oh, thanks. I was about to ask. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is all TypeScript here. Um, everything in here has type inference. So I'm using like generics and all that. So TypeScript completion works completely here. Also in templates, everything is typed. It's just like TSX. Um, so if I say something that doesn't exist, it tells you that can't find it. Uh, well, this probably works because M is a string. <laughs> um, but yeah, as you can see, it pretty much, uh, so it pretty much, like you get all the same TSX goodness um, from here. So if I say, uh, take this to mode dot uh, ends with, right? So because it's a string, you get auto completion of all the string methods from it, right? Um, yeah, literally like everything inside template is the same as in TSX. So um, not much to complain about really, uh, maybe, something that can be improved regarding the uh, the generics. But as you can see, I'm also defining props using pure TypeScript syntax here. So um, this is actually a TypeScript type literal. I can also say uh, interface props and then just put it here as a generic argument. So honestly, I would say it's pretty pleasant to use script setup with TypeScript, with Volar, the whole combination just feels, it actually gets kind of gets out of your way. And um, also pretty performant, to be honest. Johnson's been doing some interesting stuff lately with something called takeover mode, because previously in order to get TypeScript service in here and in templates and in normal TS, right? There are actually like, three copies of language servers running at the same time, but with takeover mode, it would only need to... So takeover, takeover mode means you disable the VS Code built-in uh, TS service and let Volar do both, uh, let Volar do both your view files and TS files. Um, so, so that reduces the amount of memory requirements by more than half and uh, so if you have a slow machine, you probably want to try that as well. But I mean, on, I'm on an M1, so I'm, I'm kind of spoiled, but honestly, everything <laughs> has just been working so smooth lately. Uh, it, it's a really fantastic DX. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We have a couple more questions. We are running um, out of time, so let's see how many we can get through. Um, when will we get slot type support? Um, slot is not fully typed, uh, mostly because um, we don't have an API for you to actually declare them. Um, so there is an, I believe there's an RSC discussion thread for it. But if you, um, if you're only checking, say, the slot presence, um, Volar already does that to some extent. So when you use a component, and I'll actually check that whether that component has a given slot in its template. And if you 
render pass it a slot with with the wrong name, it'll actually yell at you. So it kind of already does some of that. So my, but mostly about checking uh, the slot presence and the correct names and all that stuff. But slot props is probably something that demands a uh, dedicated API for you to, somewhere for you to declare the slots essentially. Right. Yeah. All right, let's see. Is it or will it be possible to pass types as component props? I don't really understand this question, to be honest. Props are, by definition, values. I guess you mean generic components? Um, Perhaps. This is some, if that's what you mean, uh, this is something we'll be discussing. It's pretty complicated because of how complex views component type inference already is. Um, the challenges we have to support options API and composition API at the same time with the same type interface, which is pretty challenging. Uh, so this is something we've been looking at. It's pretty complicated, uh, but it's definitely something we're, we're trying to solve. Yeah. Um, Evan, we have a bit of a request for you here. Uh, can we name the next view release as Voyage? <laughs> um, so I guess people, if you haven't noticed, the, the releases are alphabetically ordered. So um, 3.2 was, uh, what, what was the 3.2 code name again? Q, hey, I right? remember one punch. <laughs> O-P-Q. Uh, 3.2 was, um, how can I forget this? <laughs> yeah, quintessential quintuplets. Yeah, so 3.2 is Q. So uh, 3.3 will be R. Right? So that's the hint. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see who can guess in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. When do you think companies will start to replace View 2 with View 3? Uh, I think our new documentation will probably help a lot with that. Um, essentially, what we're planning to do is uh, once the new documentation is complete, Vue.js.org will default to view the new documentation, which is Vue 3 targeting, uh, targeting Vue 3. And we'll also switch over all the NPN disk tags and the GitHub branches. Everything will default to Vue 3. Uh, so that's the moment when Vue 3 becomes the default. Um, and I think that'll probably give people enough signal to consider, OK, like, we, we should probably do Vue 3 now. Oh, watch out for that. Um, okay, we have two more questions left. Uh, um, will there be an integration of tooling like ESLint or Prettier with Beat? So the answer is no. Uh, interestingly, the, the philosophy of Beat is we want to do as little work as possible on the on the build tooling side. And ESLint is linting, formatting, and type checking. These are what we consider out of band concerns because a lot of people do that in their IDE already, right? If we do that inside Veed and you do it again in your IDE, we're doing double the work for very little gain. So why not just let Veed do its thing and stay blazing fast and then you let your IDE, configure your IDE to show you everything right in your editor. That's a better development experience, right? Absolutely. All right, let's see, last question. Um, what about getting template types, a TS TypeScript um, type errors during build time? Outside of VS Code, currently it requires custom TypeScript plugins. Um, would it be possible to make it more at, out of the box? So we have a tool called ViewTSC, if you haven't tried it. It's, uh, it's wrap, it wraps TypeScript, but that's really the only way for us to type check view files because so the limitation is really on the TS side because TS just TS team just doesn't want to open up the plugin API a bit more. Uh, it's technically possible. Raul's been exploring some of that, but uh, right now, you know, the easy way is use view TSC. It checks both your TS files and view files and give you the same. It uses the same diagnostics inside Volar, so you'll get the same error during build. Awesome. Well, Evan, thank you so much for your time today. I hope you enjoyed the conference. And yeah, thank you so much for answering all of our questions. Thank you.